Okay. Um, so what is OSVVM? I'm, I'm a VHDL guy. I grew up in the defense community. And um, so OSVVM is open source VHDL verification methodology. Um, yeah, I said VHDL um, and verification in the same sentence. So it's, it's a powerful and concise library and verification methodology um, that ri rivals basically any other uh, verification language out there. So we've got the capabilities. We've built it up from a library. Um, it's a complete verification library. Um, not everybody distributes all of it, so you'll see some vendors have distributed just a couple of the packages, but in their, with their tools, so don't, don't think that's the whole thing. Um, we have a transaction framework, we have constrained random support, we have functional coverage support, we have um, error handling and reporting support, we've got scoreboards, um, synchronization utilities, memory models, and we've got a up and coming um, library of models. So in there right now is some Axi stuff, but there's going to be more stuff is coming up. So you might be asking why VHDL um, and why OSVVM? And it, the answer is, is we're very relevant in the FPGA market. Um, the 2018 Wilson Research um, Group Functional Verification um, Survey actually did results this year for OSVVM and VHDL, which is pretty cool. Um, for FPGA design, 62% of all designs worldwide use VHDL, okay? Um, for FPGA verification, 45% use VHDL, 17% worldwide use OSVVM, okay? So that makes us the number one VHDL FPGA verification methodology worldwide. Now going further in Europe, 30% um, use OSVVM. Um, now the story about System Verilog, they didn't publish Europe results, um, but I did some back channel requests to get it, and 20% use UVM. Okay, so we're actually the number one FPGA verification methodology in Europe. All right, so um, what are some of the benefits? Um, we do have a transaction-based methodology, just like everybody else. Um, it's readable and reviewable by all. I don't think anybody else is claiming that, okay? Um, and when I say all, I mean verification, hardware, software, um, system engineers, anybody whose program should be able to read what a test bench does. That's pretty fundamental, okay? And in the defense community in particular, in the aerospace community, um, in any safety critical community, we need to be able to read our test benches. We need to be able to review them by everybody. Um, also, this is a notion that we introduced too, that RTL designers should be able to write test benches. It's that simple. You should be able to plug and play people and mix them on different projects with very, very minimal training, if at all. Okay, it's VHDL, just like we have in the FPGA designs. That means if you're already doing VHDL, just reuse what you got. Incrementally add things as you need them. Okay, um, we support mixed approaches, meaning you like doing directed testing, cool. You can mix directed with algorithmic, with file-based testing, with constrained random, with intelligent test bench testing, okay. Um, and it's really simple enough for um, small FPGAs and it's powerful enough to use on an ASIC. All right, so um, our framework, it looks just like any other framework. Um, we use models, we use verification components just like most other approaches do. Um, we have a test sequencer and different architectures of that test sequencer, okay, um, implement the te different tests. And, you know, System Verilog introduces this to you via OO, via factory classes. Well, we've had that since 87 with architectures in VHDL. It's not a new thing. You do not need OO to do this in VHDL. Okay. Um, our, our basic, again, another snapshot of the framework. Um, we build up our tests and test control. So this is the big aspect of it. We have multiple processes in there. Everything's running concurrently, and we're dispatching transactions to interfaces in there. Um, we use records as our interface. Um, we're kind of uh, promiscu promiscuous in that way in that we use resolution functions that allow you to do this. It's not something for synthesis, but it's something you can absolutely do in test benches. And it's record-based, so when um, they mentioned STL using structures, that's VHDL's form of records. And in VHDL 2019, um, we will have interfaces layered on top of records. Okay. And then we have our verification components that implement our waveforms. Okay. 
taking a quick but brief deeper dive into um, more details, again, test control, you see the whole test in one file. Okay, anything we do as constrained random, we're layering in here. Okay, one process per stimulus source, it's concurrent, just like your DUT is concurrent. Okay, so the concurrency is not fork and join, it's leveraging HDLs, what HDLs already have. Okay, um, stimulus generated by procedure calls, this is what we call transactions. Transaction is nothing more than what is the basic waveforms your design does? It does reads and writes. Okay, let's implement those as subprograms that actually talk to the models that hand off and say, do this operation for me, please. Okay. We have synchronization primitives, um, a couple different forms of barrier synchronization, just like in software world that you have barrier synchronizations for concurrency. Um, this is in lieu of fork and join. We have to synchronize our processes somehow. Okay. Um, and indeed, um, we use the same approach, whether we're doing verification components or whether we're implementing the waveforms into procedures themselves. Okay. And all OSVVM capabilities work in this, in this framework. They also, most of them work in a regular VHDL test match. Okay. Now, if you're new to verification and using randomization and using constrained random techniques, you might be saying, hey, why should I be doing random? Okay. So let's, let's take a quick look at a FIFO test. Okay, and there's certain things I have to do to test the FIFO. I have to test, fill it up, empty it, run it for a while, reading and writing, and then I have to test endpoints. Did I hit empty? Did I hit full? And this test here, I did a analog graph of the FIFO word count so that I can see pictorially did I hit the endpoints or not. And this is a directed test doing it. And you can see the directed test kind of moves like a robot. You say, yeah, I could pretty much check off everything in my test plan and say, yeah, I did it. But are you confident? Okay, but before you say you're confident, let's take a look at what we can do with randomization. With randomization, just by putting some ad hoc heuristics there, I can say, fill it with a burst and then wait, fill it with a burst and wait on both sides to push and to pull, and I can get something much more realistic with very minimal effort. Okay, this is not a hard thing to do. So the benefits of randomization then is we get realistic stimulus in a timely fashion. And when we say timely fashion, we're not meaning execution time. We're meaning to write. I can write it. I can run it. I've got lots of CPU resources, so no problem. Okay. And it's great for anything that has a large set of similar items. Okay. Network packets, um, modes, sequences, and that sort of stuff. Um, math, probably not a good idea. Okay. You're probably not going to get a great test of math. Um, so if the test is not faster to write or more thorough, then you ought to be using a different method, okay? Even if that means collecting waveforms in the lab, because you can sample some real equipment and then playing them against the design, that's always a good idea, okay? And your test environment should facilitate that. Okay, so we have a very basic randomization library, okay? So random and randomize with a range, randomize with a range with some excludes, do sets of numbers, do distri weighted distributions that return a predetermined set of values. Um, it starts with zero and goes up to n minus one, where n is the number of values you have. Also, do a weighted randomization where I can specify the weight and the value I want it to return. Okay, so, um, but by itself, this is not constrained random. This is just a library. Okay, so to get to constrained random, it's code, plus randomization methods, plus transaction calls. Okay, so this is something I've done with a UART. Just using that distribution, I want 70% normal transfers. I want 10% of the time I want to get parity errors, 10% of the time stop at errors, 5% of the time stop and parity errors, and finally 5% um, of the time break errors. Okay, and then I just set up a sequence and I process it with a case statement. It's very simple. I set some settings to my transaction call that I'm going to do here in a minute, and so I'm setting up for no errors, and then I'm setting up my data values. Okay. And the constraints are interesting because um, when you have a stop bit error, you don't want to generate a zero because then that looks like a break error. So you, you do have to eliminate some of the sets, and then we dispatch a transaction based on the stuff we set up. Now, that's not the only way. We could be dispatching transactions as we run along through the case statement also and doing multiple things in there as it makes sense. Okay. But a mere mortal can 
read this code and digest basically what's happening inside. Okay. Now the other thing we come up against is functional coverage. And functional coverage is simply code that observes what the tests do. Because as soon as you start randomizing, if it's true, constrained random, you don't know what the test did anymore. You don't know if it hit the endpoints, right? Okay, so we need to track our requirements, our features, our boundary conditions with our functional coverage. Okay. And this tells us that we've actually done everything. All right. So we have a couple sorts of terminology. Item coverage, look at one thing, okay, but maybe like bin it. You're looking at transfer sizes. You want to know if you did some little ones, some big ones, and some things in between. And we're particularly interested in the little and the big ones because that's usually where we break. Okay. Um, also cross coverage, correlating two independent things. Okay. So has a certain set of registers been used with each set of in possible inputs with an ALU, for example? We'll, we'll take a look at that one. That'll be the example we look at in here. Um, why not just code coverage? Okay, well, code coverage tracks code that's been executed, right? But it misses things that are not in code. The binning, the correlation between different objects does not happen in your code. Um, also, code coverage, by the way, is optimistic. You run code coverage in VHDL, think of a process with a sensitivity list, it runs every time something in the sensitivity list changes, right? That could be multiple times in a clock period. The only one that's relevant is the last one that ran during that clock period. Now, code coverage certainly is valuable because it tells you you didn't, if you don't get 100%, it says you didn't do something. But if you didn't, if you get 100%, that's not saying you did everything. Okay. Okay, so OSVVM implements um, functional coverage via um, coverage package. It's basically a utility package. It, it um, builds a data structure in type inside. It has a, a protective type. And we actually go out and build a data structure of, of the, um, coverage model. And um, let, let's take a look at how it works. Um, first, our example, we're going to be looking at a very simple ALU. It's going to be an adder that takes eight different inputs from two different sides, from two different um, inputs. And we want to know, has each of the eight sets been used with each other? OK, so this is basically a Cartesian cross of all of our inputs. OK, and this is probably the easiest thing for any language to do. All right. So in OSVVM, we set up a shared variable. That's what we do with protected types. It's we, again, we're going to build our data structure in there. We give it a name, OK? And then we start adding things to it. So we say add cross, and then we need to generate our bins. We need bins 0 to 8. Zero, we need 8 bins, so with 0 to 7, 0 to 7. Um, and we're doing, when we say add cross, we're crossing those, doing a Cartesian cross of the number of parameters we have. Um, OSVVM allows you to do this of up to 20 parameters. That's probably more than you need because even if each one has two, that's a million sized coverage model. That's huge. Okay. And then we're going to do some uniform randomization. Okay. This is as good as it gets. Uniform randomization is just like constrained random because these things are independent of each other. Okay. And we do our transaction. Somewhere we have to collect our coverage. I'm kind of cheating here because I want to show it all in one example. You really should be observing this at the source. But I'm going here and I'm going to do work real hard. I'm going to validate this um, transaction method and I'm going to prove that it actually does what it says it does. Okay, and if I do that, then I'm okay. Okay, then I can collect my coverage here. Okay, and then I'm checking, am I covered? This is a feature of the data structure itself. We have a number of, uh, an API in it. Um, basically, in summary, when we look at a Cartesian cross, OSVVM is absolutely as concise as any other language is. In System Verilog, you set up your items and then you cross them. Okay, so this isn't any harder than System Verilog or E or anything else that's out there as far as coverage goes. Now, the one thing I'll say though is we have a huge degree of flexibility because we're building our data structure at runtime, right? We're not doing it declaratively. We didn't have to invent a new language to do it declaratively. You can just use anything the language already offers. Okay, so um, incremental, yes, absolutely. Um, using basic loops and if statements and conditionals, absolutely, it's easy. Okay, everything that's out there using generics, 
to determine what the coverage model is, to control switches. Yes, you can even pass coverage models via generics. Okay, this is all stuff that's being done right now. Now, one thing we'll note, though, um, about constrained random is it can be slow, okay? Because uniform randomization is all about uniform over a large set of numbers. Testing is not, okay? Testing is I want to get some number of tests, but I'm not going to run thousands of each different test case now, am I? So what randomization theory tells us is that to do n unique test cases, it takes n times natural log n to get there. And this is why you're going to hear things about portable stimuluses, because that's one of the answers to it. Um, OSVVM has its own built-in capability that I'm going to show you here, though, too. Um, basically, if we look at that last test run, it takes roughly 315 test iterations. And mind you, that was me cherry-picking a seed that was good because I was trying to show constrained random was good. Okay. Um, but this is roughly 5x more than the ideal 64 that we would have liked to see. So that log n factor is going to significantly slow your test down, even on something small like this. All right. So, and, and vendors for their intelligent test bench tools have gone out and shown that, yeah, you can get a lot better results. Okay. And I'm not making a claim at all that OSVVM is as good as portable stimulus. I'm just saying, hey, we've got something, it's cool, and it's free. Okay. And to use it, it's actually pretty simple. We pull out our other randomizations and we just do randomization across the coverage model. The way I say this is we're doing a random walk across the coverage model or we're doing um, runtime coverage-driven randomization. Okay, note nobody else does runtime coverage-driven randomization. They do a static analysis after each run and try to improve the next run. Okay, so our methodology, write functional coverage, randomize using functional coverage, and refine it. Okay. Now, in this case, we didn't have to do any new refining. Okay. And with this, we got it roughly 5x faster. Okay. And I, I could talk about this all day, but I don't have all day, so we're going to move on to the next aspect of OSVVM here. Um, transcripts, logs, and affirmations. This is basically our messaging in VHDL. How do we do reporting and that kind of stuff? Okay. So we need to simplify error reporting and messaging. Um, we have a transcript file. We can open it. It basically says, all oh, OSVVM output now goes to this file rather than just the output. And we can mirror it and also send it to the output if we want to. Okay, and then that means we can use write line without a file parameter and we just write to that file, the transcript file. We also can print using strings. I like to print with BHDL 2008 to string because it gives us something closer to printf but not there. Okay. Um, we also, with respect to printing, we have logs. Logs are about message filtering. We can set different parameters with logs and or um, levels with logs, and that allows us to turn them on and off. So like a debug message or something like that. It allows us to turn debug messages off. We can have info messages on. Um, we also have past messages, which are for final reporting. Okay. The next thing we have is alerts. Alerts are all about checking errors. Okay, VHDL has a cert, so why do we need something else? Well, asserts flag messages, right? But when I get done, nothing. Okay, so alerts signal the message. That, that does the same thing assert does, but it also counts. And I use alerts for all protocol and parameter type checking. Okay, so it's basically alert if it, it takes a conditional you can, there is a number of different forms, so um, it takes an ID or not, okay, so this package ID you don't have to have. This package ID, when, it, when we print the alert, it gives us that little in my package, so it gives you a location where it happened at. It, it helps you identify the source, okay? And we have basically the normal levels, failure, error, warning, because, but because we locate it against a model, that gives us a great degree of discrimination of what happened. Okay, so I think that's really all we need as far as levels go. We have enables in the form of set alert enable. We have stop counts, set, set alert stop count that says if you, get ten, if you get 10 errors, maybe it's time to start debugging. Okay. Failures, it's set at zero. So if you get a failure, it stops immediately. Um, error and warning, it's set at infinite. Affirmations are for self-checking. Other people call these checks, right? And basically, it prints an error if it 
miscompared or it prints a passed if it passed. And affirmations, we also count and we tell you how many you got. So it, it's an indication of the quality of self-checking. If a test doesn't have any affirmations, then nobody did any checking. So maybe it didn't pass. And when we get done, we have a report alerts. We also have a report non-zero alerts. So if you don't like a full um, print of things, um, you don't have to. And basically, with a simple form, we get passed or failed. But if we're using IDs, we get a whole tabulation for each of our models. And this is where the report non-zero alerts means something because in here, sometimes if you have a lot, a lot of models in play, you don't want the ones that have zero printing. Okay. And this is, when people talk about scoreboarding, this is like a scoreboard of the whole test results. Okay. But we also have scoreboards for value checking um, for data that's minimal, the way I'll say this, for data that's minimally transformed. You're sending something from one location, you want to see that it was received in another location, you just, the transmitting side sends it over to their scoreboard from the test bench, and then when the receiving side gets it, they check it against the scoreboard. Okay. Um, is a generic scoreboard. We have FIFOs inside, we have methods that help us do small transformations of the data so we can compare things. Okay, we handle out of order execution, we handle drop values also. Okay. So again, VHDL 2008 introduced generics on packages, which allows types, subprograms, constants, and other generic packages to be passed around. Okay. And the basic set of methods inside this protected type. So if you're not familiar with VHDL's protected types, protected types are almost a class. Okay, they're a container. Okay, so, and I, in OSVBM uses them frequently. Sometimes we bury them, though, so the user doesn't have to interact with them. Okay, and when we use it, we create an instance. These are two instances that are in the OSVBM library. So we have a scoreboard for standard logic vectors and a scoreboard for integers. Note the standard logic vector one is not size, so it plays some fun and games in there that allows you, that does some dynamic allocation for it. Use model, very simple. We have our shared variable. We set up an ID for it. This is for reporting purposes. And then we push and we do a transaction. And on the other side, we just do a check. We do a transaction to get something and then we just do a check against that transaction. Okay. So the test bench side no longer handles whether it compared or not. It's actually thrown into the scoreboard. The scoreboard internally does an affirmation, and it, with that reporting ID, it will report it out in your um, logs when you're done. Okay, so all the reporting is automatic. Um, I didn't think I needed the alert log stuff when I started writing it, and then when I got it done and realized I no longer had to think about, did I remember to add in all those error counts? No, it's not a thing anymore. I don't even have to think about it. It's all tabulated in the, in the table for me. Okay. Next thing we have is memory modeling. Uh, memory modeling, you can wipe out your entire, you can slow your simulations down enormously. And back about five, eight years ago, I had somebody swap out what they were doing. It was an Altera memory model with ours. Their simulations were taking 24 hours. It ran in an hour. Okay, so with a good, that's just saying with a good data structure, you can do a lot better. Um, OSVVM imp internally implements a sparse data structure. We allocate on the fly as people write to things. We allocate a block of storage locations. They are integer based. Um, that's good and bad. Um, integer based means you can do up to 31 bits. We're stealing the 32nd bit to indicate that there was a bit that was an X inside. Um, we will have different policies in the future, but this is the one that's implemented now. Okay. So basically, we work with another shared variable. We call init to size it. Note we're not statically sizing it, we're runtime sizing it. Um, this package actually evolved before VHDL had generics. And I'm waiting on protected types to have generics, which is in the next revision, which I hope everybody out there is implementing. <laughs> um, and then we do a write and we do a read. It's just as easy as using array. So if you were using arrays, you can just drop in, replace this. In fact, it's actually easier because with arrays, you have to convert your address 
into an integer. Here you can just use it straight as a standard logic vector. Okay. We have a number of synchronization primitives. We have wait for barrier. This is one of the one of my go-to's is wait for barrier. It's a barrier sync. It says stop this process until this other process is also called wait for barrier on the same signal. Okay, again, it you, plays games with resolution functions in there. There's two. Uh, we use a standard logic vector and we use an integer underscore barrier based one. Integer bar underscore barrier, I think, is the best one because it tells you how many processes are waiting. If you look at the barrier signal itself, it tells you there's five guys waiting for it right now and you can watch them count down if you need to. We have toggle and wait for toggle. Most of these have been replaced by barriers. Um, we have some aligning the clocks. We have two different flavors of that. We also have some request transaction, wait for transaction. That's some of our primitives for um, handing things off between our transaction procedures and our models. Right now in the library, we have um, Axie Lite. Um, the better versions are in the development branch. They probably will be pushed within the next two weeks, I'd say. We're going to do a push in, on the Axie Lite, Axie Stream. Um, and those will be better models than, they, than, than that I've seen. Most of those are better models than I've seen out there. One of the, one of the problems with Axie Lite is it has all writes, reads, um, write data, and address can all be independent of each other. Okay? This is the only model I've seen that does that, that gives you the capability to run things independently with each other. So, um, and you are, that's something we have internal right now, but it's passing all regressions, so it'll probably be pushed within, within a couple weeks. OSVVM has a community, okay, um, at osvvm.org. Um, we, Synthworks supports it. What, what I get out of all this is this is part of our uh, verification classes. I, we do training. We do VHDL training. We do it worldwide. Um, I blog about OSVVM. We have our GitHub site where we have everything. Um, and we've had a boatload of clones out there. All right. So wrapping up, OSVVM is a complete methodology. You only need OSVVM. We support basically everything that other vendors are, are that other languages are supporting out there. We're, we have a growing library. Um, we've got the methodology stabilized enough now that we're going to start asking for others to start joining us and, and, and participating in, in the libraries. Um, it's powerful. It's concise. It rivals what others are doing. It's simple. It's readable. And it's reviewable. And that's, I think, really important in, our, in the safety critical community. Um, Okay, and again, I want to stress, your, your RTL designers should be able to do verification models. Okay, that's just, you know, having the gap that we have in the current other languages out there, it's not a good thing. You need to be able to swap people around in different projects. All right. Questions? So first of all, how do you handle timeouts? Timeouts. Oh, yeah. Um, wait for barrier. We run a control process. Mm -hmm. And um, wait for barrier, uh, the one that runs in a control process, we actually put a timeout in it. Okay. So it basically effectively has a watchdog over the whole test bench. But in VHDL, um, the wait statements also give you the ability to timeout with um, the for clause at the end of it. So on transaction basis, we'll put timeouts with the wait, and wait until for. But overall, the whole test bench, we use to wait for barrier with the timeout. Okay. And second question, uh, if I have a system where I, I read a memory before I write to it, can you detect that? Yeah, you'll, you'll return in the memory model, you'll return to you. You, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it works just like a normal memory model would. Uh, what about support for uh, interfacing with uh, golden models or reference model uh, written in C or MATLAB, there is a simple solution like the system Verilog DPI. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that we have a great answer for that right now. I've heard that VHPI has somewhat of it. We were going to put a DPI in, in 2019. Yeah, a VHPI um, is, is not a simple solution. It's very yeah, well, no, no, no. There is a um, aspect of VHPI that the VHPI guys say is not a direct programming language interface but looks a heck of a lot like it. Um, and 
I haven't started playing with it yet, but um, some of the Case Western guys had done some stuff with, with some of their stuff they'd done. So, yeah. Thank you. No questions? Well, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>